I have feelings about this next guest that are so positive. And I didn't even realize what a big Red Sox and New England fan. And oh, man. This, is, this has to be your number one moment Absolutely. of the last two days. Absolutely. This man changed your life. Changed my life. Forever. Forever. When you win a World Series after never having won one in You're almost forever. forever. The rest of time. That's it. He could do anything. Terry Francona could do anything. He could do anything. And he's done everything. Tito, thank you. <laughs> I love you. And you're a beautiful Thank ball you. man. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank man. you. <laughs> Is there anything better, Terry? Welcome to the Rich Eisen Show. You're stuck with me. People don't know this, but as president of the Marlins for all those years, Terry and I have known each other since 1999, 2000. And I'm pretty sure when we've spoken, we never thought that we'd be speaking together on the Rich Eisen Show, <laughs> which is amazing and lucky for us and me and the audience. I was just last night talking to Josh Beckett. And guess what? We were talking about you. Uh-oh, my ears were burning. Your ears must have been burning. What you were able to do in corralling to win a World Series, I think that the most underrated thing that people don't get is the role of a manager. People, because you have to explain your X's and O's moves. But to me, when I'm evaluating managers, that's about 2% of the equation. It's about all the other stuff to get these players out on the field and get them to potentially hit 80% of their potential. And you were one of the greatest of all time doing that, Terry. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Um, I, I agree with you. I think I think every market has different challenges for managers. And like you say, though, when you have good players, get out of the way and let good players play and just try to make it easier for them to play. It's hard to make it easier. There's so many distractions. I'm thinking about when you first started your career with the Phillies versus at the end of your career with the Guardians. The difference is jarring in the money the players had. The difference is jarring in the entitlement that some of the players had and your ability to both manage up and manage down, manage up into a front office, manage down into groups of players who may not appreciate sort of the position they have is another defining characteristic you had. And I think people underrate that when they're talking about managers and coaches. Can you just tell us, did you find that to be challenging as your career continued to unfold? You know, you raise a really interesting point. Times certainly have changed. You know, in 1997, when I was the manager of the Phillies, I remember going to uh, Ed Wade, and I wanted to get a thing that was called Inside Edge. It's kind of a new, newer, <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, thing to kind of scout. And I believe it was five hundred dollars, and we didn't get the okay for that. And then you look up twenty years later at where the analytics have gone and how many people are involved, and you know, five hundred dollars seems like kind of a drop in the bucket. It's funny you say that because uh, old school managers, and you're both new school and old school, and you have to use analytics. We, we demanded that people use them as just an arrow in the quiver. I don't agree with being fully analytic, and I don't agree with ignoring the numbers, but people don't realize that you can't just, you have to look at heartbeat. Joe Torre, you and I once talked about heartbeat. I love that conversation. And people talk about it and slowing the game down. Do you, do you like that as a concept? Do you evaluate players using that? I love, I love what you just said. I think as a manager, as a coach, as a player, anybody, probably as a radio host, if you're ignoring some information, you're probably missing the boat. If you're relying on one part of information solely, you're probably also missing the boat. So what you try to do is if you have a question, get it answered correctly. And the best way to do that is by being well-rounded and using your eyes, using you know your brain, using technology, using video, and never forgetting for one minute that players are human beings. One thing that you and I have not spoken about, and I want to bring it up just ever so briefly, uh, was what happened with Trevor Bauer, and I don't mean after he left you. I'm talking about on the mound. One thing that I have talked about 
constantly with players over 18 years is understanding the chain of command, understanding when to make an issue. Because I didn't want to tell players to shut up and dribble, but I wanted them to understand where they can decide to not shut up and not dribble. And on the mound, when you're being taken out of a game, that doesn't strike me as the time to do it. Uh, I assume you had never seen anything like that in your entire career at that moment. It really stunned me. As a matter of fact, I wasn't sure. I thought I saw it, but I was like, there's no way that happened. (laughs) And you can imagine, and Trev right away knew that he probably had gone a little too far. And as you can see in that picture, he's trying to explain to me, and I'm, I wasn't having any of it. I said, well, we'll take care of it back in the underneath, behind the dugout. So that's what we did. You know, no one could have projected how that would have gone with Trevor. But one thing that you commanded was respect. And when the Red Sox were heading to their first World Series in 04, I, I know the pressure. I know what happened in 03 to the benefit of me with the Marlins and we beat the Yankees when you guys lost. Unfortunately, it wasn't your team. It was the Red Sox at that time uh, when they lost with with the home run by Boone. But when you're taking over, <clears throat> having seen what happened with the team in 03, to a team that had not won in 782 years, what what are you thinking in your mind? Like, are you trying to put it out of your head, or are you making it clear in spring training, we we got to get this? You know, it, it's funny because I, I don't remember ever even talking about it. Um, I said the same thing, you know, in Cleveland. They kept asking, you know, because they hadn't won since 1948. And as you know, winning is hard enough as it is. And I didn't think it was fair to our players that my dad's teams couldn't win. Shoot, that's not their fault. So, (laughs) you know, just try to stay in the moment and win. And to be truthful, I was so excited to be the manager of that team because normally when you take over, you know, you're taking over for a team that's had been struggling. That's why Mm -hmm. they make managerial changes. And this team was built to win. They just, you know, again, they got down to, you know, 03 and you saw all that, what happened this team was really good. So it was an exciting time more than anything else. I once fired a manager of the year. So sometimes it, sometimes mm-hmm. you can come in seriously in 06, Joe Girardi won manager of the year and we fired him. I'm not sure why that happened. Cause he was manager of the year. You were in charge. <laughs> I was in charge. I know exactly why it happened. <laughs> Can I'll stay away about- from that one. I'll leave that one to you. <laughs> Terry, you, on a side note, and we don't have to say it now, you know what happened also. It is not a secret. Catch the Rich Eisen Show every single day on the Roku channel, 12 to 3 Eastern, for free.